Good morning. Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to, to Tories. My name is Mike Am. I'm a partner here at the firm, and it's great to see all of you here this morning. And this promises to be a really terrific uh, panel that Ken and his colleagues have set up. Obviously, uh, an incredible amount of important developments for Canada. Um, in the region, especially now, with um, relationships uh, being more challenging with our immediate neighbor to the south, um, it gives us an opportunity to focus on the further developments um, throughout the region. Uh, so I'd just like to thank you all for coming and hand it over to Ken and the panel. Thank you very, thank you very much, Michael. It's, and thank you to Tories for hosting. It's, it's always a great pleasure to be doing an event at Tories. I'm a proud alumnus of this wonderful law firm. Uh, and they're always very, very hospitable and very accommodating to all the all our peculiar little details when we put on events. So again, thank you, Michael, and thank you to the folks at Tories. Um, I should mention, we are, you can see the bright lights. This, this event is being taped. It will be posted on our website soon after this event for those of you who want to look at it again and anybody else who has not been fortunate enough to be in the room with us here today uh, so therefore obviously as i may have mentioned it is it is on the record um, we're very excited about the panel today and uh, we have people from let's see toronto new york city mexico miami and uh washington slash columbia so we we've assembled a, a broad uh, a broad base of information around the hemisphere on the political and the economic situation uh, now and then going forward for this year. Um, we've also uh, beefed up uh, our, our political acumen on the panel this year because of so many changes that are going to go on politically in six, at least six elections that are going to be going on and, and a couple other transitions which may not be clearly elections but certainly transitions uh, in power. Enough for the introduction. With us today, we have far all the way down at the left, Jonathan Hausman, who's the managing director and head of global strategic relations at Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, who's also chairman of the board of the CCA. Um, Chris Sabatini, who's founder and executive director of Global Americans and the, uh, the, news, the um, online news source, theglobalamericans.org, which if for anyone following politics and economics in Latin America, I would say is imprescindible. It's, it's something that, that one must read on a daily basis. Chris started it a few years ago at, out of New York City uh, with original content and also aggregating other content. And just for disclaimer, I'm on the board of directors of that, um, but, I, but I'm not drawing an income that'll allow me to retire from it or anything like that. No, no, not at all. Um, but it's Chris. Um, then we have uh, Eduardo Suarez, who's Vice President of Latin American Economics, who is clearly one of the leading Latin American economists. Um, and we're really happy that he could come up from Mexico and be with us today, a longtime supporter of the CCA. And then John Price, Managing Director of America's Market Intelligence, um, who's a Canadian, although he actually works in Miami. Um, and because he works in Miami, we bring him up here for political balance um, uh, and sort of we're trying to bring him back into the fold a little bit. Um, but so that, that's, that's the, 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 the crack panel that we have this morning and we have a lot to cover. And the format is we'll do some, some overarching uh, questions and some comments and then we'll get country specific uh, because there's a lot to be said about what's going on in a number of the countries. We will not cover all of the countries in the hemisphere. Unfortunately, sometimes in the past we try and do that. But given the nature of what's going on and the electoral processes in these countries, in some, a number of these countries, we just think it's more time to spend, uh, it's better to spend more time and concentrated time on them than try and cover, uh, cover every, everybody in the hemisphere. And there will also be time for questions afterwards. Uh, and and this, this, the room is configured in such a way that um, you can just stand up and, and give the, the question without having to write it down on a piece of paper and, and send it up to me. So it'll make, make it more intimate that way. Okay. The, I'd like to just start talking about where Latin America is in a conversation about where Latin America is in the, glo in the global sense. 
how is it com how does its development what are projections compared to what's going on in the rest of latin america we have a tendency sometimes to think about latin america in in, a, in, in sort of uh, in, a, in its own encapsulated way uh, without really positioning it in, in the rest of the world and, and, and how it's performing. So in, I, I would like to ask Jonathan if he could start off giving a conversation of, of, around that issue. Sure. So, um, I mean, it's very difficult to answer that question without making some uh, general statements about where we think we are in the, in the broad macro uh, environment globally. And um, it is the, uh, it's a tale of two cities, as, as we all know. Um, on the one hand, uh, this is a spectacular synchronized global economic recovery, and markets have discounted that to a certain degree already, um, and um, kind of an unusually positive scenario for emerging markets generally from an economic point of view. Um, exports, which were always kind of the dog that didn't bark in the recovery for YEMs in the last three or four years, um, which I think we can posit really is the sine qua non of a real strong EM um, a robust recovery, they're there, it's coming. And um, so this, this uh, obviously puts a lot of EMs, no matter where they are, in good stead from an economic point of view. Having said that, uh, we also have something of a crisis of governance um, that uh, I would say is not solely the province of uh, emerging markets, nay, I would say that um, actually it's uh, right in our faces um, as we enter uh, customs uh, in the US. So um, from that point of view, uh, LATAM, I think, begins to stand out. Um, let's just say that the economic, the global economic recovery for, for, uh, as it relates to EMs is sort of an equal opportunity help. But I'm not sure in the governance side that we have really the same hom homogeneity. Um, LATAM is basically dealing with years of faulty governance, uh, dealing with the, the legacy of that. And in a very grotesque way, as it is in Brazil, as it is in Peru just recently, with, an, with really ripple effects from Brazil and the Odebrecht scandal, echoes of that, of course, in Colombia, and all of it affecting elections. <laughs> so um, I would say that um, we can look at this as a glass half full or empty. I look at it half full. I think that when you are faced with um, popular revulsion, um, the, te the institutions are tested and they are improved. Whereas in other parts of the emerging markets, um, governance is in decline, and they're not facing. They're actually have already, that seems like that debate has already been had and has already been won by the wrong side. I look at Hungary, I look at Poland, I look at Russia, I look at South Africa, I look at um, elements of the China story, more complicated, of course, and um, there, there's no confrontation, there's no debate. It's, the debate is over. Uh, Turkey is the obviously signal example of that. So I think in that sense, LATAM looks pretty good. Eduardo, do you want to talk a little bit, uh, bore in a little bit on Latin American economies and where you see them in overview before we get specific? Yeah, uh, as Jonathan said, uh, there's a positive support from the rest of the world. The PMIs are seeing that um, the economy in the, in the world is getting healthy for the first time in, in many years. We have global trade uh, on an upswing. The commodity prices have uh, risen and all that is positive for, for Latin America. Um, so we expect, uh, we literally have every single major country in Latin America growing faster this year than the last. Um, uh, however, there's uh, a lot of uncertainty, uh, elections. Uh, there's gonna, that's gonna affect whether uh, countries can reform further or not. Um, in Peru, the government is very weak at the moment. Uh, their capacity to execute on their infrastructure uh, program will determine how strong of a rebound they can have. Uh, and the president is currently uh, very weak in the le legislative. He has 18 uh, Congress people out of 130. Uh, so it's very difficult to execute a budget, well, uh, to approve, even approve a budget if you don't have enough backing. But uh, we hope that the, that the pact that they seem to have made will help somewhat. Um, in, in, but overall, I think the story is relatively uh, positive. Uh, there's going to be a lot of volatility in markets, uh, which means uh, a lot of headaches for all those already in Latin America, but it also means that we're going to have very good opportunities to invest because things are likely to get cheap over the course of the year. Um, we expect investment in the region will remain strong. There's a lot of opportunities opening up for investment across the region. Uh, we have a, a, a swing towards more market friendly governments in, in the Mercosur, uh, which should bring additional investment. And in 
Uh, some cases that we have had reforms, for example, in Mexico, where they've opened up additional opportunities, which uh, we expect will gradually lead to additional um, investment. For uh, this is already the largest privatization in in Mexico's history from the, from the energy sector and investment in in a, in a sector such as this should be uh, incremental in the impact it has on on growth. A little bit of the macro view, but macro and and view inside Latin America. China is is becoming a, a more important player in Latin America and daily, and in six of the countries in Latin America, China is seen more favorable than the U.S. is now. A, a bit of a one might say an interesting data point. Some might say shocking data point. Um, John, what what does this mean? Uh, and what does this mean for Latin America going forward? And how might it e actually come back and affect Canada and Canadian investment in the hemisphere? Right. Well, I think the positive image of China is not so much a reflection of China, but a negative reflection of Trump. But uh, the but we China has been re relatively quiet the last two three years in Latin America. We haven't heard a lot, and the reason is because you know China made big investments in Latin America during the. Uh, resource price boom of 2003 to 13. Uh, China's long-term strategy is to secure uh, maximum employment at home, which means they need cheap and reliable sources of natural resources from around the world to feed factory China. And traditionally that was done through long-term contracts, but when resource prices were high, it didn't make sense to lock in a 30-year um, resource uh, deal, instead go and buy the company. So they began to buy lots of companies. However, um, and anyone who was selling a mine or an oil field uh, concession at the time realized that the biggest suckers on the globe were the Chinese buyers. They were overpaying 20, 30% for their assets. Well, the reason for that was because the money was going into Panamanian bank accounts in the names of the Chinese bureaucrats running these SOEs and the local politicians in the countries. So when, Pre when President Xi came in and began his purge of corruption, which began domestically in China, eventually it extended out to the Chinese-owned mines and, and oil concessions around the world in Africa and Latin America. And very quietly, they called back country managers of these mines across Latin America and sort of slapped them on the wrist. And there was basically no more outflow of, of public funds into the resource uh, industry in Latin America for a couple of years. Now we have sort of China 2.0. And China 2.0 is much more diversified. There, is a, there will be monies coming back into resource. It won't only be uh, state-owned enterprises. It was also a lot of private money. So more than $10 trillion of, of Chinese uh, pr private savings has quietly emigrated outside of the PRC into bank accounts in Hong Kong and Taiwan and other places. And a lot of it is private monies going into resource projects. But also importantly is the fact that China has gone from being a maquiladora economy to owning its own brands. China now owns, there's 50 car companies in China. And those car companies do not comply with the sort of environmental and safety standards to penetrate, say, the U.S. or European markets. So they're targeting middle income markets. So you see Chinese cars in, in Lima and in Quito, in Santiago. They're going after these markets with their brands, with their automotive brands, their IT brands. The biggest selling cell phones in Latin America today are not Apple or Samsung. They are uh, white branded uh, ripoffs. Um, uh, I mean, not ripoffs, they're, they're legal product, but they are, they're white label products made by Chinese factories. Uh, you now have direct links between the biggest e-commerce sites in Brazil today are Chinese e-commerce site, and there's now direct shipment from factory to Brazilian consumer um, through Alibaba and the local post office in, in Brazil. You also have um, infrastructure. So China overbuilt infrastructure uh, as a response, as sort of a fiscal response to um, the, the financial crisis of 07, 08. And now, uh, they've overbuilt in China, so now they, to keep all those engineering firms employed, they've now invented, you know, the, you have the um, One China policy, so you've got infrastructure projects in Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, but also in Latin America. So they're very interested in infrastructure projects, many of which were considered unviable a few years ago. And last but not least is tourism. So the greatest factor in, in world tourism for the next 20 years will be outbound Chinese tourism. 
And after the Chinese go, first of all, to local, uh, to Chinese destinations and then near Asia destinations, they then go to Europe and then the U.S. And then next on the list is the Caribbean. That's typically how global sort of travelers check their, their list. And uh, so now they're, the Chinese are building out infrastructure in the Caribbean to, uh, in anticipation of this wave of tourism. So you have very, uh, a very much more diversified public and private funding across many different industries, Chinese investment, and they will continue to be big players in bilateral lending um, and, uh, and commercial lending, but, but you're also going to see a lot more FDI coming in. Thank you, John. I, I want to bring Chris into the conversation now on political ramifications. But before I do, Chris, I just want to do a follow-up question with John. Uh, what does that investment, the, the, how you just described the Chinese scenario, what are the implications for Canadians doing work in Latin America, either exporting or investing in Latin America? And after that sort of sweeping survey, it, the question is, well, what's left for, for the Canadians to, to get engaged with? Right. Uh, and, and where would there be competitive advantage and, and where are there competitive advantages that Canadians haven't even thought about yet in, in the hemisphere? Well, certainly in the resource space, Chinese, Chinese companies have, have preferred to buy Canadian assets, mining assets, energy assets. Even though those assets are in Latin America, they're protected by the governance rights of a Canadian company, which they prefer to buy and taking a minority or even majority position in a purely Latin American company. So. I think Canada and Toronto in particular has been an interesting intermediary of those resource sales. And um, the, the degree to which Canadian companies can joint venture with Chinese in energy and infrastructure, I think is very questionable. The Chinese tend to bring their own pool of, of um, subcontractors and partners. And I think it's very frustrating for companies from other countries to get in, get in on that business. Um, so I think it's more real. The, re the reality is more selling assets to the Chinese that they've developed in Latin America than, say, partnering. Thank you. All right, Jonathan, I'm going to ask you to comment on what John said as well. But first, I want to go to Chris. Thank you for being patient and waiting. Um, in Jonathan's opening comment, he, when he painted the picture of governance in Latin America compared to Poland and Hungary and Russia, and South Africa, et cetera, et cetera, and other countries that we know of, it doesn't seem so bad uh, in comparison on, on the governance issue. Um, but those of us who follow Latin America worry every day about the decline of governance, certainly in a, in a number of, of the countries. Uh, and there are some overriding issues right now, particularly one of them is the corruption, which seems to be playing out in a lot. A lot of it related to Odebrecht, but, but not all of it. I mean, in, in Costa Rica, where the first election comes up in February, it's about a cement maker. And, and in Colombia, it's a bit about Odebrecht, but it's about other things in uh, campaign finance and, and, and the way highways were financed, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So maybe you could just give an overview how you think governance and the political processes will play out, have played out over the last year and going forward in the coming year. Yeah, so first, I'm a little less optimistic than Jonathan. I'm, I'm not a pessimist by nature, and in the short term, I'm optimistic, but I do think there are some, some real troubling trends. So first of all, in the elections, we've got six or so elections, Costa Rica, Colombia, not in this order necessarily, Brazil, Mexico, um, Paraguay, um, Venezuela maybe, who will, that will be up to Nicolas Maduro. Uh, Cuba is somehow listed, but uh, entre comillas, that, that's Spanish for air quotes, I think. Um, that's more of a post-Castro coronation than an election. Um, I think this is going to be the year of election and sort of where you see the anti-corruption backlash. Um, across the board. I mean, if you look at sort of trust in public institutions according to public surveys, it's at an all-time low. They're slightly, you know, politicians, the judiciary, legislature, slightly more popular than used car salesmen right now in Latin America. Um, so what this, but I think in the short term, this will not necessarily drive, there's a lot of alarmist scenarios where Jair Bolsonaro of, of, of Brazil could get elected or AMLO and, and Mexico could be elected. Um, I, I think this, this round of elections will skew, will sort of hew more to the center than to the more extremes. But having said that, and this is where I'm a little less optimistic, is I do think this is not going to go away. We've seen advances. It's one thing to be able to investigate and even prosecute cases of corruption. Actually addressing the structural causes of corruption depends on political will, 
um, and sort of putting the, the, the very people who are part and parcel of that, who've been beneficiaries of that, in charge of constraining themselves. I'm not sure we're going to get there. I've never seen, in terms of I'm a political scientist, I've never seen historically any moment where countries have been able to completely turn that corner and institutionally reform themselves. Even take, say, the case of Italy, which was taken as a, as, as a, as a successful case, um, still obviously continue to elect populists, still is dogged by problems of corruption. I, I just don't see how Latin America will address it. So this run of elections, definitely an anti-corruption wave um, sentiment. I'm not sure the next round of elections that we'll be able to see any sort of results out of that. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we, on the more optimistic note, is this is the year of return of economic growth, as Jonathan was saying. And Latin America is going to grow on average by 2% next year. Um, now, that, av that actually masks sort of much higher numbers, because in that is Venezuela, right. which obviously there's one huge standard deviation from the mean, and that's Venezuela, which will contract by as much as 4% next year. But you've got, you've got Mexico 2%, you've got Brazil 2%, you've got uh, th Argentina 3%. There's, it's, it's looking very positive. They're digging their way out of the, the valley that they were in before, and that's very, very positive. Having said that, again, not to be a pessimist, there are a few um, looming challenges. One is obviously pension reform in places like Brazil, um, places like Peru. We're looking at a real fiscal overhang um, in places like Chile even on pension reform, which they will have to address. Maybe not this year, but in the future. And then the last factor is the unknown, and that's, that's Trump. Uh, let's be honest. Um, you know, the... Just, what, two days ago, a couple Canadian uh, officials leaked to the press that they think that Trump's going to pull out a NAFTA. Um, the effects of that are difficult to gauge. I, I, you know, it, it, there's obviously the trade disruption, <coughs> potential trade war, but also in terms of what it would do in terms of confidence for investors, uh, in terms of just overall emerging markets, uh, would be huge. And in the same fact, you, you, I'm glad you're doing something at the Summit of the Americas, I'll be there, but we're not sure Trump's going to be there. The rumor is Trump's not going to the Summit of the Americas. And is that, I mean, it's amazing. This was started in 1994 by then President Clinton. Um, it's a U.S. initiative. And, um, you know, it's, it's part and parcel of a larger Trump, uh, for lack of a better term, strategy, though I'm not sure it is, um, let's say <laughs> idiosyncrasy, um, that, you know, he pulls out of multilateral agreements. He doesn't have much patience for summits. He doesn't have much patience for other leaders. He certainly doesn't care much about Latin America. You know, if the U.S. pulls out of the Summit of the Americas, or doesn't attend in this case, I think, you know, will it go on? Probably still. But, you know, what that means in terms of U.S. leadership, in terms of leading investment, trade, um, even in terms of issues of just the, the general normative infrastructure, if you will, of uh, the region is going to be very much at risk. So, you know, everything could go well in the elections, the economy's growing well, and then there's the Trump factor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, Eduardo, go ahead, and then I want to come back to, to Jonathan. Thank you, Chris. I'll bring the optimist side of this. <laughs> um, I think the one, one thing that's interesting about Latin America going on at, at the moment is that um, civil society is waking up. Uh, Latin American uh, democracies are very young. Uh, I'll use the example of Mexico. Mexico really became a democracy only in the year 2000, which means it's a 17-year-old democracy. Uh, it was a presidential regime, so basically there was no powers outside of the executive, and a normal functioning democracy needs to have three powers as counterbalance, the executive, le legislative, and judicial. <laughs> Um, when the election happened, Congress suddenly emerged, and it's now, I would argue, stronger even than the executive power. The problem is that the judicial power doesn't exist, and the, and the, the way you solve a problem of corruption or a problem of security is through having a strong and independent judicial power. Um, I think the best way of creating that is if civil society <coughs> wakes up, which is something similar to what happened in the U.S. about 100, 150 years ago. Uh, there's actually two really good documentaries on, on this. One of them is called Robber Barons. Uh, if you look at the list of the U.S. Robber Barons of 100 years ago, and you look them up where, where they are today, they're called the, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Carnegie Endowment, and so they became institution builders. Uh, something that's going on, I think, in, broadly across Latin America, but I'll use the example again of Mexico, is that these, the former robber barons of Mexico are today also becoming institution builders. You have organizations, for example, Mexicans United Against Corruption and Impunity, which is funded by one of the billionaires in Mexico, which uh, has led to the current arrest of 15 governors in the country, which I think is absolutely unprecedented. Um, 
And the, the way that they're going about this process is, uh, is by building institutions. As the first thing they did, they passed a law. All civil servants and elected officials need to make public their statements of, int of, of conflict of interest, tax returns, and statements of wealth, which makes it much easier to track corruption because if you take a picture of a governor going in, into a, in, driving a custom-made Ferrari into a $5 million penthouse in, in Miami, then something's wrong and you can verify it against their, their statements. Um, the second thing you need to create more transparent trials. So we're moving towards the verbal and open trials means that when you do put these officials in, in, in a court, uh, all the global media will be there. They will film the, the, the court case and it will be much more easier to have um, uh, a, a transparent justice. Uh, however, as Chris said, it's all not rosy because the, the final problem that, that there is is that the, the region is still developing the capacity to investigate crime. It's still de 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 developing the capacity to prosecute professionally. So the risk is that many of these governors will actually walk free because they'll invent something that they didn't read them the rights at the moment of the, of the arrest, and so they'll be free sipping margaritas in six months. Um, but I still think the fact that uh, civil society is waking up across the region and they're, that they're pushing to build institutions the right way, which is developing institutions that uh, counterbalance each other uh, structurally, is a positive story. So, <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to paint the, <laughs> the little angel in there. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot better now, thank you. <laughs> than, was, than after Chris is, uh, I know John wants to come, but Jonathan, I, I want to, uh, you can comment on, on the political issues that were just discussed, but. I also want to bring you back to the issue of opportunities for Canada in China, following John's comments a bit, for, I mean, the opportunities given the panorama of China and the other circumstances going in in Latin America. Uh, you're a major investor in Latin America. Uh, you compete with, with enterprises from all over the world for the investments that you make. Uh, do you have a sense of where there are still very good opportunities for Canada to get engaged? Again, the same question to John to a certain extent. Engaged in areas that we would all understand to be traditional Canadian areas for investment, but others that, can, that Canadians really should be thinking about that, that they're not, that they could be very competitive with. Okay. Um. These chairs are made for very tall people. Yeah. <laughs> well, in the past, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the past, we've done bar stools, <coughs> yeah, yeah. and I know you guys so are I'm more saying, comfortable. I'm, like I'm really interested because I. Yeah. Can't. <laughs> um, so, uh, just a few comments on what, what we've talked about. Yeah, about one minute on each. The first is, um, I think um, Chris's comments are well, very well taken, uh, and I do worry about the sustaining uh, of this kind of um, uh, confrontation of the old elites and the and the, um, the pathologies that attend to so many of them in, in these countries. I would say that there is an unusual moment here, particularly given the economic um, well-being that uh, seems to be bubbling in, in some of these major countries, that and I'll just use the example of Brazil, although I think it's equally true of Mexico, is that this could be the very, very first time that more orthodox economic reform is associated in the minds of households as being connected to growth, because it never has before. And I think that actually um, creates a potential for embedding some of this in a, in a millennial generation that has known only really kind of either excess of one kind or another, um, I think is very important. Second thing is um, te on the technology and transparency and these movements, and I've, I've actually sat with the very people you're talking about when I was in Mexico recently. And um, I, I just think that um, uh, openness is one thing. Hyper-openness is another. And we live in an era when everything is public. Everything is public. And I think depending on what kind of society you're in, it can be a problem or it can be a real help. It's a problem in lazy societies that have had everything. Because it allows people, a minority, who are active, but are all usually active on agendas that are kind of... Um, uh, despicable, you know, bananistas, shall we say, um, to gain currency when they really oughtn't, because our real institutions and the real civil society is sleeping or watching TV or in VR heaven. Um, whereas in societies where there's something to complain about, it can be extremely effective. And I think that's the case in Mexico. I think it's the case in Brazil. I think it's increasingly the case um, in even lesser developed countries. Now, on your question on, um, uh, on opportunity sets, uh, and these two points I've made are not irrelevant to that uh, commentary, I can tell you. Um, look, uh, there's two broad 
themes that I'd like to touch on very quickly. The first is, look, China is a formidable player. It, it, it used to be sort of a, a um, I don't know, a, like a confection. Um, Chinese money, it was you know, a very low cost of capital. It would come in, it would build something for you. You really never knew why. And it was all because of the agenda that John very articulately laid out as to what the Chinese strategy of the new era, to use Xi Jinping's uh, thought, uh, implies. But that is a relatively niche kind of involvement. So the question is, um, does China sort of crowd out Canadian investment? And I believe no. I believe it's a very different kind of arrangement, a very different kind of conversation that takes place when a long-term Canadian investor is involved. And I'm not talking only about pensions, although that they tend to be quite active, uh, whether it's from Quebec or from here in Ontario or from out west. Um, it's a different conversation. It's a conversation based on a mutuality, i.e., and a transparency. Look, we are pensions. We want long-term stable cash flows, and we're willing to take some extra risk to make more money doing it because we think we understand what's going on better than the average bear. So that's why we're here. Um, and that conversation is had with individuals who are both in the official sector who are like, okay, you are people we can deal with, and we do share certain fundamental values. And second, it's dealing with the elites that the ones that are not locked up, all six of them, um, who, who obviously are not crooks, because if they were, they'd be in jail. So it's a very helpful thing for a Canadian investor who's you know, got very uh, important and, uh, and critical fiduciaries like we do, that we can say, look, these are the people who actually made it, and they are dying for partners that have a vision that is beyond just we have these particular natural resources requirements, and we, are, we have these particular labor requirements, just as John was saying, and you kind of fit the bill. I don't care whether you're in Venezuela or Argentina or whether it's Mexico. We're just, just, you fit this box. When, I think when we look at opportunities, we look at it from the point of view of, do we share some fundamental values? And is there an opportunity here to use our knowledge and our insight and our relationships to uh, derive the kind of cash flows that we need for our fiduciaries? And I think increasingly that answer is yes. Thank you. John. Yeah, I just wanted to bring to everyone's attention a sort of growing trend in Latin America that is, that is well known around the world but is not thought of going on in Latin America, and that is disruption. So Latin America uh, was as exposed to globalization through trade agreements as any part of the world. In fact, the Americans whining about the effects of NAFTA makes me chuckle because Mexico suffered far more from NAFTA. The disruption of NAFTA was far greater in Mexico than it ever was in Canada or the United States in terms of basically decimating a mid-size uh, industrial base. And so the, uh, what you have today in much of Latin America is pretty competitive uh, manufacturing base. What is being left unscathed is, this, is the service sector. Education, transportation, um, public transportation, um, health services, banking, retailing. And traditionally, uh, McKinsey just did a study that said, that looked at growth across six different regions did it come from a growing labor pool, which is demographics, or did it come from increasing productivity, which is absorbing new technologies? Well, Latin America scored relatively high in terms of demographic-driven growth because of changing demographics, but scored the worst of all the world in terms of absorbing new technology. And a part of it was that the purveyors of technology didn't want to lend their technology, didn't want to license their technology to Latin America in the past because they were worried about piracy. Well, now with cloud-based technology, and open source, you have a flood um, of technology. The Airbnb, Netflix, and Uber, the fastest growing market in the world for all three companies is Latin America. Mexico City is by far Uber's most profitable market in the world. Because, not only because they've displaced so many traditional taxis, but they're able to charge twice as much as a conventional taxi. Because of the transparency and security that comes with getting in an Uber versus a traditional cab in Mexico. Um, Latin Americans are now absorbing this technology and, and you will see uh, this will be both a positive economic boost but will be a huge political challenge in Latin America as, as millions are put out of work. I was in a liquor store in, in, um, in uh, Miraflores in Lima a month and a half ago. The liquor store was a quarter the size of this room and there was seven employees um, you know, with three customers. 
And, uh, you know. Yeah, but you, you've been in a lot of liquor stores. I've been in a lot of liquor stores. I, so, you know, so. I have a representative <laughs> sample of liquor right. stores. But, uh, <laughs> but, I mean, that's the sort of, that's the sort of over, overemployment that goes on in so many service sectors in Latin America that I believe will be radically disrupted. Now, is this good or bad? That's a macro philosophical question. But the, the, any change and any rapid change is an opportunity. And this is where, you know, Canadian technology companies, particularly those operating in a B2B environment, because we don't have as many retail technology companies, but we have a lot of interesting B2B technology companies. There are amazing opportunities in Latin America in particular niches that either improve productivity, uh, replace human, um, uh, humans with, with technology, uh, that is going to be taken in by Latin American governments. The days of, of rising top line revenue in Latin America, I think, are coming to a close. And the way that companies will grow in Latin America for the next 10 years will be about cutting costs, much more than about raising revenue. And so they are looking actively to source technology to help them do that. And that's, that's an interesting opportunity. <clears throat> I'm going to break with tradition. Uh, we're gonna, I want to move into country, uh, certain country-specific discussions, but this has been such an interesting conversation, at least listening to it, um, that I'll open it up for questions now on the sort of the broad topics that we've been discussing before we get into the country-by-country country discussion. So if there are any questions, we, ha we can take uh, time for a few, please. Yeah. Uh, we're going to use the microphone? Fantastic. Okay. Right there, sir. Hi. Um, talking about China, the, well, no one's mentioned this. Uh, it's a, a bridge and road initiative. What uh, impact is that having on Latin America? Because there are the four countries which have the, uh, it, uh, you know, the Pacific Pacific Alliance Agreement. Not to mention building stuff uh, in Latin America, which you're trying to discuss, but also the impact of moving goods faster and easier around the world uh, w with various trade agreements. Right. Okay, we'll take a couple. Uh, and then we'll. Uh, thank you. Um, two quick questions. First, I wanted to know if any of you can comment on the proposed uh, panel in Nicaragua that's supposed to rival the Panamanian uh, can, uh, canal. It's been in talks uh, amongst my circles, speaking with people. They don't know what the status is, but it is a very strategic uh, canal that has a lot of ramifications in the region. So if any of you can comment on that. And secondly, um, the elephant in the room, I guess, I would like to qu ask the question for is the, we just mentioned the emergence of technologies, specifically in Latin America, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it is profoundly impacting uh, institutions domestically, nationally, internationally. Um, and what we're seeing right now in the coming days, the government of Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela is going to be releasing a cryptocurrency called the Petro, where each coin is going to be backed by a barrel of oil. Uh, this is, and it's speculated that it's going to be released in six weeks. This might have good or bad implications, but it will have ramifications in the region. So I wanted to know from either of you if you can comment on what you believe the implications of this petrol currency will have in the region, and if you see any other countries following suit. Thank you. I thought that the, all the Venezuelan oil has already been pre-sold to China, but we'll find out. Uh, one more. You remember all these? <laughs> okay, let's, let's take these. Uh, China, the uh, canal in Nicaragua, and blockchain technology. China. Go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, so the Belt and Road. Um, uh, look, it, the, the, the fun, it's somewhat amusing thing about the Belt and Road, um, what used to be called the One Belt and One Road. Um, I think they felt it was a bit too exclusionary, so it's just like it's a belt and a road. So, um, and I think there's a reason for that, because if you looked at the maps as they have evolved since the uh, original discussions and the original design. It started as essentially a re replication of the um, Silk Road routes, um, which are quite, you know, historically uh, embedded in, you know, Samarkand and all sorts of really neat places that nobody knows where it is. And it's now essentially the entire world. There's the sea belt and road, and then there's the land belt and road. And yeah, Latin America miraculously sort of showed up about two years ago as part of the belt and road. Now, I think they have roads, and I know that Latin Americans wear belts, so it's clearly <laughs> familiar to them. <laughs> Um, so um, I think that, you know, in a way it, it's become so diluted that it's basically the Chinese system that they're trying to, 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 to explain. And the system is an interconnection of countries that have a deal with China. 
that have bought in, if you will, in one way or another to this kind of neo-mercantilist system that creates the results that they want. It is an, it is an alternative um, uh, uh, ecosystem to the existing uh, sort of North Atlantic created American dominated hegemonic process, which as we all know, uh, they have precisely correctly diagnosed as being in retreat. So Latin America is just sort of part of that story. I think they, they, they realize at some point, so, well, what, why does it have to just be in Eurasia? It should be everywhere. And I think that's the relevance of it, frankly. It's really, if we understand how the Chinese are operating globally, we'll understand what the impact will be on uh, Latin America. Thank you. The, the other part of that is that uh, this year in Asia, $2 trillion will be spent on infrastructure. The, the most ambitious estimates of, of Trump's infrastructure plan was about 900 um, billion. So Asia is driving the demand for copper and zinc and, and cement and, and, and those, uh, many of those industrial metals have come up from their low significantly. And I think Chinese spending and the, and the, the promise of Chinese spending in infrastructure is what continues to lift resource prices. Yeah. Yeah. Can I comment a little bit on the, on the canal? <clears throat> Short, quickly, don't wait around for it. Yeah. It's not going to happen. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be getting a, a barge to cruise through Nicaragua anytime soon. Um, it's fraught with problems. <coughs> the investors actually disappeared. No one really knows where he's... Yeah, the Chinese yeah. investors disappeared. Um, there are a whole series of, of, of uh, indigenous land use issues and environmental issues, the tides. It's, it, it, was, it was a... Um, it was a pipe dream to begin with, uh, and it's not going to go anywhere. Now, um, it, it's so, not to begin so negative, but so is the Petro. Um, you know, basically, virtual currencies or, 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 or cryptocurrencies depend on trust. You have to believe, because there's really no reserve currency there, you are trading in something in which you trust that it has value, <clears throat> which is a little different than the way, and, and there's no reason to trust or believe that the Nicolas Maduro regime will ever have or be willing to back in any meaningful way, because part, most of its oil already, is already going to China, and the rest is just sort of now just staying in the ground because they can't get it out. Um, you just look at the, the, the value of its real currency, which is ridiculous. Um, th there's no, the foundation of trust for, for a, a cryptocurrency does not exist in Venezuela. It, it, in, in fact, I would argue it's the least likely country to ever create its own cri cryptocurrency because of the fundamental lack of trust. So. I wouldn't put, now on blockchain technology generally, I think that's very interesting and it goes to what John was saying earlier about sort of disruption. That will <coughs> fundamentally change how services are rendered, how transactions are conducted. I, I, I don't even know much about it, so I, I feel free to opine about it forever. Um, but the point being is that I actually, I mean, I think it will, I don't think we can actually estimate what the effect will be, but I think it's gonna be huge. I'll leave it at that. Edward, did you wanna jump in on this? Sure. On, on particularly on the the uh, the blockchain. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think blockchain has a ridiculous number of applications and potential. Uh, on on the petro and on on cryptocurrencies broadly, uh, I'm not one of those constructive Bitcoin fans. Um, <laughs> a, a, a currency is a, is a store of value. You don't have no idea how much. A, a Bitcoin is fundamentally worth whether it's going to go to 32,000 or zero. Uh, I think that the purpose of investment is to take risk, not, not uncertainty. Uncertainty means I have absolutely no idea what can happen tomorrow. Risk, I can more or less assign probabilities to it. So if I want to double my money tomorrow, I think it's uh, Bitcoin is uncertainty. I, I have absolutely no idea if tomorrow they're going to make it illegal because it's a, a ridiculously uh, um, attractive vehicle for money laundering, uh, uh, paying, uh, kidnapping, etc. Or if uh, tomorrow is going to be at 42,000, if I, if I want to double my money tomorrow, I'll walk up to somebody and say, here, I have a hundred bucks. Uh, I will flip a coin. I, I will either tomorrow uh, have $200 uh, dollars, or I will have zero. If I want to quadruple my money, I'll take a, a flip of a coin twice. If I want to multiply my money times eight, I'll, I'll do it three times. Um, I think that's uh, taking risk. Uh, so I, I think uh, for me, Bitcoin uh, broadly and the cryptocurrencies in general are, are not attractive. Um, the, um, and they also have a lot of problems. I, I was just uh, with one of the uh, major um, kidnapping negotiation and, and, and rescue uh, companies in the world. And he was telling me that basically every single major kidnapping that has happened in Latin America in the past year has been paid with Bitcoins. Uh, the, the extortions are also paid in Bitcoins very often. And so there's a lot of... Um, 
bad um, things related to it. I, I have no insight on whether regulators will say this is made illegal, but I do know that if tomorrow regulators say from now on it's illegal to for Visa to, to clear transactions with cryptocurrencies and, and MasterCard cannot do it and American Express cannot do it and Swift cannot do it, then Bitcoin's going to zero. Um, um, so I, I'm, I'm not uh, particularly constructive on cryptocurrencies in, in general. Thank you, Eduardo. I, I want to move now to area and country specific discussions and we well, let's start off furthest down south in the southern cone um, and why don't we John maybe you could talk a little about Argentina the, the, the past year everybody was was watching very intently to see what was going to happen in the congressional elections what is going to be a bit of a um, increased mandate for the for the Macri government to continue with the policies that they had or was there going to be a retrenchment uh, in, in, in essentially the, the, the bit of the, rev the economic revolution and then the political revolution, I use re revolution advisedly, that he was trying to, to pull off in Argentina. Uh, he came out well in, in, the, in the congressional elections. What do you see going forward for Argentina? Well, it's always interesting to talk about Argentina and Toronto because this is like the last place on earth that, that sort of woke up, or uh, that's a bad way of putting it, that, that, be, that, be, that believed, that began to believe in a new Argentina. Um, our friends at Scotiabank have been uh, particularly vocal over the years at um, uh, denouncing Argentina with good reason. They lost $300 million, um, at least. I think some say up to 600. But um, the point being that uh, as Argentina this made is, a- This is on the record, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I know. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're not a client. Um, but- uh, <laughs> <laughs> it never will be. Yeah. But uh, no, but in, in all seriousness, um, I, you know, I've been studying the region for 26 years, and so I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, and I've never been as optimistic at the early moves of a new government as the early moves of the Macri administration. They did everything right. Um, and not only sort of directionally, but they actually even included degrees of moderation when it came to scaling back subsidies and things like that, that I thought were much more humane than we've seen with sort of neoliberal governments in the past. Um, there was, you know, there was typical outcries and everything from the opposition, but um, the, what, what I think disappointed everyone in Argentina and those watching was the fact that in spite of the fact the government is doing everything right and there seem to be ripe opportunities in agriculture and energy, in mining, et cetera, the foreign direct investment was not going into Argentina. What the Argentines failed to realize is that, you know, to get boardroom approval on a major foreign direct investment in a country where all of your historical numbers for the last 10 years are pretty depressing means that the due diligence process takes time. And now what we've seen is that when c companies were finally getting ready, then there was the midterm elections. They said, let's just wait a little bit longer and see how these things shake out. Well, things shook out as positively as, as one could, could hope for. Cambiemos gained in the Senate, gained in uh, the House of Reps. Um, they didn't take a majority position, but basically they became the strongest political bloc. The Peronists, which are sort of like the LDP in Japan, they're broken into different blocs. And the Kirshner bloc lost a lot of prestige and a lot of numbers. So he was able to continue his reforms. And more importantly, it was a bold signal to foreign direct investments that it's now safe to go back in the waters in Argentina. So I think 2018 marks a year where not only is the reform agenda back on the table, but more importantly, money is now coming into Argentina in a big way. Um, the slight increase in oil prices that we've seen uh, over the last 12 months will make uh, Vaca Muerte much more viable. Um, and the, what Argentina's done in mining in terms of getting the provinces, all but I think three important exceptions, to come on board with a, a consistent, um, uh, consistent uh, policies around royalties and, and treatment of foreign investment is helpful for the mining community. Argentina has, you know, a very similar geological profile as, as Chile, so there's no reason why it cannot be a strong destination for mining investment. Um, and then the ag sector, um, so many of the, uh, of, the ex of the tax revenue of the Kirchner administration were taxes on the export of commodities. Those were lifted, uh, which, which meant that a lot of big 
scale farmers who were holding back investments have now moved forward with those. So you put all that together, combined with the fact that the currency is depreciating at a much slower rate than the inflation rate, which means that the acquisition power of Argentines is going up and up. And those of you who visit Buenos Aires regularly are, are lamenting the fact that your favorite steakhouse is getting more and more expensive. Um, <laughs> but what that means is that Argentine consumers um, are, are, are increasing their end consumption. September of 17 versus September 16 was up 24% in dollars. Uh, a lot of what people fail to, when we talk about growth at 2%, 3%, that's, that doesn't blow anybody's mind. But what we forget about is the fact that when things go down in Latin America, current money comes out, currencies drop. And so it's always helpful to look at the GDP in Latin America based in dollars. Because at the end of the day, most of you are going to report your businesses in Canadian or U.S. dollars. And so it really doesn't matter that a country grows at 3% or negative 2% in, in local currency. What matters is what happens in dollars. And what we're seeing in Argentina is massive growth in dollarized measurements. Probably over 10% last year, we'll see 10 to 15% US dollarized growth of GDP this year. That means that if you're exporting, you should be looking at Argentina. Jonathan, yeah. you were uh, on the mission with us with Prime Minister Trudeau in Argentina soon after the government took power in what was November 16, I believe and we met with all the ministers and uh, I think it's fair to say that the people in the delegation were thought it was interesting but it was a bit of a, a wait and see. Uh, is it less of a wait and see for you now? Um, <clears throat> so a, a little bit of uh, context. So uh, I, like John, have always been a skeptic about Argentina and um, uh, I've been investing in uh, uh, Latin America for 22 years and I'm I can tell you that uh, I was the last person on earth to be giving the benefit of the doubt to Argentina. Um, what, I, what, I, 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 uh, what I think is that what we heard back in November of, of uh, 2016 was, if this, then that, if this, then that. And it had a lot to do with, despite what John said about dollarized GDP, the people who vote are local currency GDP. And so they need to see the two, the one handle the three, what 2.4 handle, whatever your, out, your, your forecast was for 17 or for 18. It was if we can show growth, again, going back to my point about aligning reform, a sensible reform with actual performance, he said, uh, this was Cabrera at the time, uh, the Minister of Finance said, we're going to be okay. And, um, and he was right. He wasn't there to enjoy it, <laughs> but he, he was right. Um, and I think that they have passed through the two big tests. Can you build a political movement? Like he, I, I think Macri, in many ways, is like Macron in France. Sort of create something out of nothing, you know. And this is a world, again, getting back to my point about the openness and, 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 and dynamism of this, uh, what IT does to political life, is that you can do what Macron did. I mean, in France, of all places, I mean, God. So, so Macri has passed that hurdle, and he's also passed the economic hurdle. He's shown that if we do these things, and I think sensibly, by the way, we can actually grow this economy and your, your wealth will grow. Well, your income will grow. The wealth is still pretty impaired. One caveat, however. You know, I remember back in 2004, uh, traveling through um, Brasilia, meeting with the then, uh, minister, uh, then central bank governor, of course, was Mireles, who was now the minister of finance. And a group of us um, were there berating them about the inflation expectations in Brazil and the uh, rather high level of, 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 um, of notional volatility in the forward curve of the real. And I would, sis, I would say the same thing in Argentina today. I mean, inflation is stubbornly high. And as long as it's in almost 20% zone, the expectations of, infl of inflation in Argentina will remain very elevated, which they are today. And everything is there, but I think investors are not just looking at political phenomena. They're also looking at, look, I have to be assured that we are on a steady downward march in inflation. And inflation expectations is what tells you. And in Brazil, despite all of the problems that we've seen, if you look at it in the broad swath of history, there is the steady march. I mean, if anything, inflation is too low now, according to the central bank. So Argentina has not established that hurdle yet, has not 
transcended that hurdle yet. And I think it'll be a while until it does. Having said that, I do think that um, the central bank is well managed, finally. It used to be managed by a series of puppets and fools. And uh, I do think that now the market is beginning to get a sense that maybe we're beginning to turn that corner, but we have not turned it yet. Chris, do you, politically, do you think Argentina has turned a corner or might be turning a corner? Yes. Uh, well, let me say, first of all, so echoing something that Jonathan said earlier. I don't know if that's me or someone else. The, um, you know, despite all the potential headwinds in the region, <coughs> there, you know, we've got governments in Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, quite likely in Colombia, that are very well equipped and very, both in terms of their technical capacity, their orientation, to deal with this. I, I actually think, you know, in, in terms of moments of investment and economic growth, we're looking at one of the most positive conflations of, of economic and political situations that very positive. So that's very good. In Argentina, what's interesting about Macri is that in the past non peronist governments, <clears throat> They simply didn't know how to manage power. It was Alfonsín or De La Rua, they were just hapless. Uh, um, Macri actually, um, as a technocrat, actually kind of acts kind of like a Peronist. He knows how to twist arms and work the system, and that's, that's why we saw the legislative victories last year. Um, it's why we see his ability to reform pensions and other things. He's very, very savvy, in addition to having a very capable technocratic team behind him. I'm actually very, very positive on, on Argentina. And of course, part of it is also the parents themselves are so divided um, among themselves. But it is, Macri, not enough credit is given to his almost neo peronist ability to manage power. And I mean that as a compliment. Um, so I'm very positive on Argentina. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Eduardo, let's talk about Chile a little bit. Just came through an election. Uh, Sebastian Piñera has been reelected to the president after sitting out a term of uh, President Bachelet. Uh, what do you see the uh, prognosis for Chile? I think it's in a very good moment. Um, and it has to do with, with the elections, but I think it also has to do with what's got happening in the world. Um, Chile, if you try to look at what's going to happen with the Chilean peso, one big thing is to look at copper. Um, copper is, um, is an interesting metal in the sense that it's a middle class metal. Uh, the more people rise in income, the more they start buying houses. Uh, iron ore is, is more of a lower income uh, country metal. Uh, uh, and as the middle class is growing place, for example, China and China, and I think that comes back to the Silk Road. Um, the Silk Road uh, is gonna boost um, incomes in a lot of countries around China. China is all, itself already becoming a middle class country. And as that uh, growth of the global middle class happens, uh, the demand for copper should continue to rise. And I think that's gonna be a big uh, boost for, for copper besides what happened in the election. Uh, on the election front, and, uh, and tying it back to copper, uh, uh, President Bachelet uh, did a lot of uh, damage to, to, to Chile structurally in the sense that uh, if you go back to, two, to the year 2000, Chile was one of the three most competitive in terms of cost uh, uh, mining countries in the world. Uh, under the, uh, the Bachelet uh, administration, a number of factors uh, led Chile to fall to something like closer to 20th in terms of costs. Um, um, with the new administration, we're gonna see a lot of these uh, costs, especially the regulatory ones, unwound. That will make investment in Chile much more attractive. Um, there's also uh, plans to make the corporate uh, taxes fall, uh, which in, in an environment where the US is cutting corporate taxes that should uh, buffer the, the blow for, Ch for Chile. Uh, and we're talking about, very, about a potentially very important cuts in corporate taxes, but Chile increased the, the corporate tax from 20 to 25%. Uh, if that gets brought, brought back to 20, it, again, we have a more attractive investment climates in, in Chile. So overall, I think uh, Chile is, uh, is positioned very well to have a, to have a good year. And they also have a very important factor, which is Chile has among, among the most, the largest uh, pension systems in the world. So you already have a domestic savings pool that, uh, that can uh, f finance these investments, but it also is attractive for foreign investors because um, if you're looking at investing in a country uh, and that country only depends on foreign investment, you're, you're scared that uh, if, if things turn sour, everybody will leave and they will not be a natural buyer for your, for your assets. The moment you develop a, a domestic pension system, you almost have a, a, like a counter cyclical player uh, that will that will help you uh, gain confidence to, to attract foreign investment. So I think overall Chile is really really well positioned, and, and the Piñera victory was was certainly uh, an initial piece of good news. 
I, just a little contrarian thinking. I, you know, Chilean elites are some of the most out of touch uh, elites um, in, on the planet, I think. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and a lot of them were sort of said, oh, God, Piñera's back. Thank goodness. We can go back to the way things were. But there's no turning the clock back on Chile. When I think of Chilean society, I think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, people take, they want to take care of, they want to be safe, right? That's the first thing. And then the next is they want to feed themselves. Well, Chile's already taken care of those two things. They're aspiring to much more. They want access to education. They want clean air. Um, they want to preserve their beautiful country. And so, you know, the student movement, the environmental movement, the indigenous movement in Chile over the last 10 years was not an aberration that's going to go away. It is a result of an aspiring country that is now solidly middle income country that wants to be better, that wants to be more like Europe. It doesn't want to be any longer like Mexico or Brazil. And I think that um, anyone who governs in, in, in Chile is going to have to say goodbye to, you know, the incredibly neoliberal policies that, yes, were important in terms of lifting Chile up and making it a competitive country. But Chile cannot rely exclusively on exploiting its natural resources because it's going to run into and miners and, and infrastructure builders and, and energy project uh, financiers will continue to confront a lot of popular uh, discontent with those projects. And, and this is going to be a real challenge for Chile. Chile has to do what Canada and what Australia did, which is develop other sectors of their economy to compete globally and not just natural resources. And until that happens, I think Chile is, is um, yes, they can refine things around the edges, but until they make that fundamental economic shift, I think there's going to be a challenge to those growth forecasts and to the ability to govern that country. Jonathan, do you want to say something about Chile? No, I think, I think John really put it nicely. Okay. Chris, did you want to talk about, about you're fine with, okay. Um, well, let's move to Brazil. Uh, election coming up, a sitting president with I think six percent popularity. And maybe it's maybe it's bumped up a little bit, um, but there have been yeah, right. um, some 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 legislation is getting through some kinds of reforms. Uh, obviously, the, the the cradle of the Odebrecht uh, scandal that has its tentacles throughout the hemisphere and beyond. Uh, You've always been uh, positive about Brazil. I mean, in the last last year we had this conversation. Jonathan, you said, you know, don't count out Brazil. Bet on Brazil. They'll get out of it and move forward. The question was what the timing would be. What's your feeling about it this year? Yeah, well, I, I, you know, as a an investor in public or private assets, that was actually pretty good advice. I think um, because actually, you know, um, public markets are priced to perfection in Brazil. Don't think it's only because of a a global equity. Recovery. I think it's because I think money has has recognized that this unusual um, confluence of circumstances in Brazil have produced actually um, quite a bit of stability and actually investments, uh, po policy investments, if you will, in the future, which um, were almost inconceivable even three years ago. Truly inconceivable. I'll just mention a few, but let me just take a step back. Um, <coughs> Brazil, if it weren't a conundrum and a quandary, or a quandrum, it's a new word I'm, I'm working on socializing here, um, uh, you know, it wouldn't be Brazil. So, I mean, we have to, yeah, 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 I would say you can't ask an armadillo to run a marathon. I mean, you know, countries have their, their foibles. But, if you, but the, the risk in Brazil, of course, is you talk to too many Brazilians because they're either madly optimistic or, like, suicidal. And um, neither is right. So, you know, we have to look at this in the broad swath of history. And um, what I like to do is I like to think about um, what it would have been like to be an investor when Franco took over in Brazil after the uh, impeachment of Calor. And what that would have been like? And what considerations would I, would I have had? And what, what I would have thought about? And I would have been, you know, petrified, actually. Fundamentally petrified. That there was so little holding up Brazil. The institutions were so weak the economy so tentative, the global environment, pretty crap, actually. And um, now I think about today, and there, you know, there are echoes, of course, of Itamar uh, with uh, the current um, 
uh, 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 situation with Temer, although obviously uh, Franco was, did not have the same stain, if you will, as, as Temer. Uh, but now I think about that in those same dimensions, and I say to myself, well, the global economy is look for Brazil today is looking very positive, with all those potentially positive synergies that I referred to earlier, politically and economically. Second, the institutions have survived the 1990s, survived the 2000s, and survived Lula, and survived Dilma, which is, I think, a great achievement, and survived what is essentially, like in the Italian case around Craxi, you know, just the most complete turnover of an elite in world history, I would like to argue. I, don't, I actually think the one in Brazil is bigger than the one in Italy. Um, bigger, at least in scale. I mean, it's a bigger, bigger place. So we're still here. And, the, and I just came back from Brazil recently. And you know, the, 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 again, the, another of the great cabinets of EM history sitting in, in uh, Brasilia right now rivals um, Argentina. I think they're both equal, actually. Um, beavering away, doing a whole bunch of stuff which has never, I don't think, ever entered the minds of anyone. I'll mention two things in particular. One, the labor reform. Labor reform in Brazil is the single most important reform that has ever been completed in Brazil. You know, John, that's crazy. You've got fiscal, you know, the fiscal law, you've got the constitution. No, I'll tell you why. Because it kills the linkage between labor and politics. Because it is now essentially the law with, you know, squint your eyes, is essentially the same labor law as in Ontario. You have to vote to have a unionized cell. You don't just get put into the system, and you don't just have to pay into the PT coffers because you happen to work in a unionized sector. You get to choose. Fundamental change to the Brazilian problem, which is sort of the, the Germanization of the Brazilian political economy in an economy that is, has one third of the income of Germany, and i.e. a labor elite. It's dead. Number two. Public service compensation. The public service in Brazil, the other great bastion of the old system that has kept Brazil from really achieving its future, is now going to undergo the most massive uh, change uh, in how it's incentivized and how um, they hire. Because now they have to align public and private wages. What's the fundamental problem, John, in Brazil is that the public sector is coddled. The public sector gets everything, the private sector gets nothing if you're a laborer. Now they get the same, at least in law. So these things actually erode the political economy that brought us the corruption, that brought us the pathologies of politics in, in, in Brazil, and brought us Lula and brought us Doma. And they are systematically being destroyed. The final one I wanted to mention is BNDS, which um, you know, is another pathology that it's almost mind-boggling what was going on during the Doma uh, period. And now they can't afford to have a fiscal, a quasi-fiscal deficit as they did, with everybody and their brother, all of them connected to the to corruption, getting these loans at at, at like con, you know Chinese development bank levels, in a country where the where the prevailing uh, nominal rate is like 11 percent, you know, that destroys an entire set of rentier uh, class and and rent-seeking behavior. So those are the things that matter, and I don't think they're going to get it reversed by any president. Now, the one thing that sticks in my mind and the thing that keeps me up at night about Brazil, because it is a very complex and, a, and, a, and still a tentative place, despite what I said about Itamar Franco, is that there is a depth of anger and a depth of dislocation in that country, which is truly awesome to behold. And one does wonder whether the anger and the fury will not express itself in this election, despite what we said, and I happen to agree with you, but it's only on the margin. Yeah that it won't express itself in a way that unleashes upon the country a really inefficient kind of leadership, a really populistic kind of leadership, whether it comes from the right in Bolsonaro or whether it comes from the left from Lula, who has not been counted out until... January 24th. 24th, yeah. <laughs> just look at my watch. Yeah, so you got two weeks yeah. um, in um, Porto Alegre, I believe. Yeah. Uh, that is the one thing that really does concern me. But I think if, if you're looking at it broadly, and even Bolsonaro, I don't think, would be so terrible, to be honest, although he's a terrible person, so it seems. Um, that w w This is a moment in Brazilian history that I think is probably as important as the end of the military dictatorship. So despite the low percentage uh, approval of the current uh, president, 
essentially this, this, this government is making Brazil great again. Is that right? Well, it's putting in the footings. It's putting in the footings. And look, there's a, there's a, con there's a contract here with Temer. And the contract is, look, you're there. You, you will be incentivized by wanting to be Franco and will be incentivized by getting a bunch of stuff done. And we know that we have to do these reforms because anybody who comes in will be in penury if they don't. And it's everybody wants the stuff done now so nobody has to wear it later. Mm -hmm. Whether you're PSDB or PMDB or PS or you know, the one of the, the, the alphabet soup of parties in Brazil, but those are the main ones that matter. You just want this done. And I think that this is a moment where it will be done in, to the extent that it needs to. The fiscal law kind of forces it. And, and then we'll get back to the circus. But it maybe won't be three rings, maybe one ring after this election. Uh, Chris, uh, Jonathan's appraisal is fairly upbeat and hopeful. So I'm a little bit, I have trepidation about turning the mic over to you. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no, I'm not going to disagree with him. I think, you know, actually, you know, Temer's lack of popularity, um, his, um, the fact that he's a lame duck president is actually working to the advantage. He can take measures that most politicians wouldn't dare to take. I mean, you can't get much lower than 6%. Um, you know, so what, what, what's there to lose? Yeah, it's still within the margin of error, right? I mean, um, the, um, so I, I'm actually very upbeat. And, I, and I, while I do think there is a risk in how this populist backlash may manifest itself, we'll see what happens with Lula. We'll see what happens with Bolsonaro. Um, I, I think there are some credible candidates in the middle, Alcmin and the mayor of Sao Paulo, who could, who could do a good job and are viable candidates. Um, so I'm actually quite upbeat about Brazil. I mean, I think the pension reform is, is, is going to be difficult. Um, I would like to see it get done now, but I don't. I agree with you. I don't think it's, it's, it, there's no appetite to do it. So, no, I'm actually quite. I mean, again, if I were, you know, I'm looking at the region. I'm seeing a few obstacles, but I'm looking at a set of governments. Um, and despite a very nasty public mood about corruption across the region, I'm seeing a pretty stable technocratic political class that will either be coming to power or is in power that can help sort of you know guide the the, the ship of state in these countries so i'm very upbeat about brazil despite the fact it's led by a man who looks like a vampire <laughs> <laughs> all right uh if you want to come in on brazil yeah um i'm i, I think there's a, a lot of short-term positives uh, happening, uh, if nothing else, well, uh, on top of what has already been said, uh, the Brazil's economy is sitting at such low levels uh, today that anything they do will be better. Uh, for an example is industrial production is currently sitting at 2004 levels in terms of volumes. Um, there's one additional thing that I'm scared of, which is, uh, I think one of the reasons why we as a bank have always liked the Pacific Alliance more than Mercosur. Um, it's the, it, it's basically not having wasted your, your crisis. Um, John spoke earlier about disruptions. Um, in the crisis that happened in, in the Pacific Alliance countries, uh, we had uh, the local oligarchs in many sectors kicked out and replaced by, by foreign multinationals. And, and we have economies that are much more open for business, much more open to trade. And that has a lot of positives. First, competition makes you stronger and having your companies and your employees competing with the rest of the world it makes them become much more productive. A problem in Brazil in the past is that because it was such a closed economy, uh, we saw for in, in the 2004, 2014 level uh, uh, period, their, their wage cost more than double. And I think that was a result of uh, just a complete detachment from global, global competition. The second negative impact that you have from not opening yourself is that you, you don't own import institutions. I work for Scotiabank, I'm currently sitting in Mexico City. I'm regulated by Mexican regulators, but I also, I'm also being regulated by Canadian regulators, by American regulators, by Chilean regulators. And they're all uh, looking at what I'm doing and whether I'm behaving properly. Um, the Pacific Alliance have, uh, countries have generally opened up uh, themselves to foreign investment. The, the, the economies are much more dominated by foreign players, and that has an institutional uh, positive on countries. Uh, and, and again, if you look at uh, which sectors are not co uh, competitive in Pacific Alliance countries, uh, it's usually uh, those sectors that have no, not been open and not been disrupted by foreign players. Uh, I think the, 
the case of the Mercosur countries, they to, which we're seeing uh, improve today, such as Argentina, such as Brazil, uh, I think they both they both need to do that. They need to open themselves to the rest of the world. They need to blow up Mercosur and join much more open trade blocks, such as the Pacific Alliance. And they, they need to open their sectors to foreign investment. Think about the banking sector in Brazil, for example. It's extremely close to the rest of the, the, rest of the world. And they have a very good uh, uh, banks that compete very strongly. Uh, but uh, even even there, I think they, uh, having foreign players coming and, and disrupt them more more actively would be, would be positive. Thank you. Did you want to say anything? If I could just yeah. summarize Brazil quickly, I would say um, for financial, financial investors who either invest in equities or even through say private equity into well managed Brazilian companies um, taking a sort of minority position. Brazil has always been one of the best places to invest in Latin America if you, if you time, time it well. Um, as an exporter, selling a product into Brazil also, if you're able to time it well and find good distributors and you're willing to shut down or, or, or trim down your operation when the currency uh, tanks, again, you can, make, you can do very well. Is somebody, as a company that wants to uh, do foreign direct investment in Brazil, set up a company, operate a company, and compete in Brazil, it has always been incredibly challenging. Unless you do it on a massive scale, it's hard to be profitable. And I think that you have to, therefore, dissect your strategy. And you know, you can't make a blanket statement about Brazil. You have to. It really depends upon the the way you're engaging in that country. Great, thank you. Uh, Let's move on to the, to the Andean region. Uh, as I mentioned, we will be doing a special event on Peru in this coming Wednesday, so we won't spend as much time on it today. But why don't, um, we'll try and touch on it, but let, let's, let's move to Colombia. Uh, first round of elections. That's good, right, Chris? Yeah. So uh, first round of elections coming up in May, as, as a few months ago, I think there were over 50 potential, you know, candidates from parties and shifting parties and, and people who are gathering enough signatures to get their name on the ballot, which is what you can do in Colombia. And now, and now the field is winnowing down a little bit. And now it's becoming a little bit more interesting and speculation on, on what, what the final coalitions might look like. Maybe you could start us off, Chris, talking a little bit about where you see the future of Colombia this year. Um, you know, there's, you and I disagreed slightly on this over email last night, but I, I think part of it is it will be a referendum on the peace plan. Um, I think who Uribe throws his weight behind will probably, he'll be the kingmaker, but I think it's, it's going to winnow down. I mean, you've got Fajardo, who I think is uh, the former um, governor of Antioquia, um, is, a, is an interesting candidate, but I don't think he has, I don't think he's going to go very far. I think he's really pretty much hit his, his ceiling. I think what you'll see is a, you know, the, the the party system of Colombia, the traditional liberal and conservatives have collapsed, but yet they still sort of reign supreme, just not in the same institutional form that they used to. So in the end, I mean, Petro will, I think he's pretty much topped out. Um, he'll be a, you know, also ran probably. Um, the FARC candidate is, is a joke. I mean, he'll be lucky if he gets 10%. I mean, I think the FARC doesn't, the problem here is the FARC is about to realize they're not that popular. Um, <laughs> which is probably a good thing, um, unless they decide, wait, let's screw this and let's go back into the jungle. Um, the, um, but I think what will ultimately happen is you'll get a consensus candidate that's basically sort of a, a combination of liberal conservative, um, Barigera, or someone, and, and I think it will, be, it will be continuity, is what I'm saying. It will, um, despite the array of different candidates, the, you know, 30 different flavors like a Baskin Robbins, you're gonna get, um, I think, a consensus candidate, the, the elite, which is very closed, obviously, and Colombia will rally. And I think you'll see continuity, even in the peace plan. Even if this is sort of a vote, Monsanto's is not very popular right now, what, he's about 30%, um, which is, I mean, Temer would kill for those ratings. Um, the, um, but I think that basically, I think you'll get a consensus candidate. It'll be more of the same. I think it's, it's, it's a, it, and again, one thing that's always <laughs> impressive about Colombia is I keep on referring to different countries' technocratic classes, is their, their technocratic classes are very high level, and I think you'll see the same quality of government that you see in this government and the previous one, and so on. I, I do say this, by the way, I am, I'm not particularly good at predictions. I worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign, and <laughs> on election night I had a party, which was the worst party I've ever thrown in my life. Um, so take everything I say on elections with a grain of salt. Um, ask me what I think about Colombia. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, yeah, no, because you, 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 you just married. Thanks for asking yeah, yeah, that no, question. I appreciate Ken, that. Uh, I defer to you. Um, 
the Colombian election now is probably the most interesting election I've seen in Colombia in, in my many years of watching Colombian elections. And it's not just for the fact of all the candidates that have been involved. It is very, very fluid. Uh, and it's, and I, I'm not so sure uh, on, on some of the things that Chris was talking about. Um, Fah- in, the, in the latest polls that are coming out, Fajardo is, is leading the path. Yeah. Not by a lot, but he's leading. And he's, and he's pulling strong in generally throughout the country, not in some areas less so th- than others. Uh, and he's formed a, an alliance now with Robledo and uh, Cecilia Lopez, who were sort of, particularly Cecilia Lopez, her big uh, platform was anti-corruption, right? And so we see that playing out. It's playing out a little bit differently in Colombia right now. It's a bit around Odebrecht, but it's around other issues of corruption and, okay. and roads that have been built and campaign finance from the Santos campaign and the Zuluaga campaign in the last time. So it's playing out in, in a lot of different ways. He's been able to cobble together a coalition, uh, and some would say he basically imposed the coalition on the other two, but he has that coalition with him right right now, and he's polling where he's polling. Uh, the, on, the, on the opposite side of the spectrum, if, if we want to talk the left-right, and it, 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 Chris is absolutely accurate, the left-right hasn't quite played out in Colombia the way it has in, in other countries historically, although there was the... And, typical antagonism between the liberals and, and the conservative parties and the violencia and all that kind of a thing. But on the right, uh, um, Uribe, it, it's basically a, a fight, as it were, between the, the candidate that former President Pastrana has picked, which is Marta Ramirez, who is, uh, has been a war horse for a number of years, uh, uh, respected uh, by the conservatives, not as far to the right by any means as other candidates like Ordonez of the conservative party. That's, that's Pastrana has his, he's riding on that. It's, it's really, uh, one can make an argument that Pastrana's influence is really quite di- diminished, how he's handled a number of things, including uh, uh, excoriating Santos over the peace agreement, which is a peace agreement. He, the biggest reason why it was a peace agreement, he wished he had, a nego- he yeah, had negotiated, exactly, exactly. and he couldn't do. Uh, and, then, and then against Uribe's candidate, Duque, who's, who's a young technocrat, very well respected, uh, but has never run anything. Uh, he's been a consultant to the IDB and others, but he's respected across the board and, and considered to be someone of integrity. Having said that, uh, in the last campaign, he was, on, he was in the meeting, in Brazil with the people of Odebrecht, where Odebrecht was talking about giving campaign finance to Uribe's candidate. So, but you don't hear so much about that. Uh, but so the, and then you have the Liberal Party, uh, the great Liberal Party, uh, and, and, and a candidate that many people in, in other circumstances might think was a very, very attractive candidate. And De La Calle, who negotiated the, the, the peace agreement, uh, was vice president under another president previously, uh, had, is, is, is considered to be very well-respected statesman. I think that's fair to say. But he's suffering from two major problems. One is uh, he's so closely aligned with the peace agreement that for uh, many of the people who are against the peace agreement, they're not going to vote for him for that reason. And also because of a lot of the corruption that's coming on, although it's across the board, is coming down harder now on the, on the liberals and the Santos. There was just an, a, a sealed indictment that came out about the manager of Santos' campaign last time around uh, and, and massive, massive charges about corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that the liberals are wearing now. In, in a big way, and, and it's going to be, it's one thing maybe to come over, overcome one of those, but De La Kai has to overcome both of those, and it's not clear that he's going to do that, and, the, and it, everybody seems to believe that he will then form an alliance with Fajardo, uh, although Fajardo says, I don't want to go into an official alliance with the liberals because we're anti-corruption and we don't, we don't, want, that, we don't want that smell on us. I think it's what it's going to come, and then you have Germán uh, Vargas Lleras, who was the vice president of, under Santos. So we, we've hosted him here before, uh, whose basic, whose basic um, uh, theme seems to be, you might, like the, you might not like the way I do things, but I'm effective. Uh, and in terms of where he was on the peace agreement, he supported it or at least didn't criticize it when he was working with Santos. And now he's come out a little bit more against it. 
I think that the, the Colombians definitely want to turn the page on the peace agreement discussion. It's been so polarizing. That doesn't mean that some people aren't going to go to the polls being driven by that one issue and vote accordingly. But I do think there's the pasar la pagina that's going on. And that's what Fajardo was hoping to capitalize on. The challenge Fajardo has is, as one of the leading commentators in Colombia just wrote, he's in, he's in the shower, but he hasn't gotten wet yet. Which is to say, if you ask him what is, he has not been specific on anything, even on the pe where he stood on the peace agreement. And he doesn't want to talk about it. He just wants to talk about the kinds of things that he did when he was governor of Antioquia, about education and, and, and other kinds of, uh, you know, a, a full range of, of social and, and, and economic kinds of issues, but in very broad terms uh, and, and not uh, dealing with, and not basically getting wet on some of the issues. So. I don't know who's going to, I couldn't predict who's going to win, but if you look at the last polls, it always comes down to who's going to make it to the second round, right? And so the general feeling is Duque will lead the right, Fajardo will take the center left, as it were, and Herman Vargas, whatever, however you want to classify it, those, that's where it's going to come down to. And the question, who, go, who gets, who, what are the two who make it through to their next round? Nobody is going to make it on the first round. That I'll say with some certainty. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at the latest polls, everybody, well, for hard those margin on winning against anybody, on, um, he wins against anybody head to head, he really wins on the second round. Because if it gets to the second round, if it's Fajardo and, 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 and Vargas Lleras, or second round, and, and Duque, they vote for Fajardo. Having said all that, the right still hasn't sorted out its situation. And once the right comes together, and I'll use the term right, between Marta Ramirez and Duque, and wherever Herman Vargas people come around, it's going to be very, very, it's going to be very, very competitive. But if you're looking to, to see how this is going to come out, it's going to come down to those three, and in the countryside, and there's uh, outside of, of the major cities, there was a study done, and that's where uh, Uribe's people and Germán Vargas are very, 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 very effective. I mean, they have better machines, and certainly Germán Vargas, nobody knows how to run a campaign, and get out the votes, however they come, however he gets them out, then Germán uh, Vargas Lleras. Um, so, politically, that's uh, thank you for asking the question, Chris. I really, <laughs> I really, I really appreciate it. Yeah, and yeah, and we'll talk about the economics you know, a little bit. Yeah. I, I agree that Colombia has the most impressive public sector technocrats in the whole region. I think, however, the private sector is small, uncompetitive, and unimpressive. And the fact is that um, when oil prices collapsed at the end of 2014, Colombia was revealed just how vulnerable and how dependent they were on oil and coal to drive their economy. No economy, including Venezuela, is as tied to the price of oil as Colombia's has turned out to be. It decimated their currency, it fell 58%. Uh, it decimated their fiscal um, uh, reserves. So any plans made out of the peace accord to build infrastructure into the hinterlands of Colombia, and everyone understands that that's necessary to cement peace can't be afforded right now. Um, the private sector has sort of, uh, there's been a bit of a resurgence of the domestic industrial base that had basically lost all its contracts with Colombian retailers to Chinese and American imports, has gotten those contracts back. But um, there's a real fundamental problem in Colombia in that it is, the, it is overtaxed, overburdened, has terrible infrastructure, and so it cannot support a competitive uh, export sector. And frankly, um, you know, for people who invest in mining and infrastructure, it's a disaster because of local community opposition. There are 37 local community referendum underway right now to block projects in mining and infrastructure and energy in Colombia. Um, the Colombians, like a lot of countries in Latin America back in the end of the Cold War in 89 or 90, signed up to the World Indigenous Rights Accord, which basically said if a piece of land has any claim to it by indigenous groups, there has to be a consultation, a public consultation. Combine that with the fact that the peace accord 
provides greater um, voice to local communities. And what you have is the seeds of a disaster of people basically opposing not in my backyard projects. And it has become a very difficult, miners are staying clear of Columbia. Infrastructure investors are staying clear of Columbia. And it's a real shame because that's exactly what that country needs to diversify its well, itself away from energy. So uh, I, I think we may want to switch gears to Mexico, actually, because yeah. so we've got like five minutes left. Yeah. Right. So um, I'm just going to start talking about Mexico and then hand it to Eduardo. Great. Uh, uh, so I'm going to set you up, Eduardo. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, it is, of course, very close to our hearts that um, because we are unusually, and the first time in many, many years, we find ourselves um, in a situation where decisions that are made quite outside of our control have huge implications for our economic uh, destiny. And of course, the Mexicans feel exactly the same way. Um, so any discussion in Mexico clearly has to incorporate um, our views on NAFTA and our views on what kind of erratic decisions that may be made in Washington. and. Um, I would just put out there um, that uh, for the Mexicans, I think the key issue is not um, uh, how bad it's going to be, but how they react. Uh, because you can react in many different ways. The, you can react in the way of d more trade is the answer, more liberalization is the answer, more of the 30-year track record Let's make another 30 years track record of Mexico as a highly productive, highly integrated, and highly mobilized economic actor. Or there's another reaction. The other reaction is um, we've had enough. It doesn't work. And uh, we told you this all along. <clears throat> and we're going to spend, and we're going to force, and we're going to coerce um, an economy to do what we think it ought to do because Mexico can stand on its own. So, and there's been both strains in Mexican history, as we well know. So I think that those are the stakes here. So um, uh, I think as, as, as Canadians, as we think about this, it's a very much a, it's a bread and butter sort of thing. It's like, you know, we got, we got this relationship with the United States. It's critical to our geostrategic and geoeconomic future. If NAFTA is, is wiped away, well, you know, we'll figure something out. And we got more in common with the US anyway, so it'll probably be okay, but very inconvenient and, and, and politically maybe not very particularly good for this government. For Mexico, it's existential. And so I want to hand that over to Eduardo and, and uh, having set the table for you. So yesterday there was an article in the, in the New York Times by Jorge Castañeda, a very prominent Mexican uh, former minister and intellectual, uh, with a very negative tone, basically saying Mexico's place with the perfect storm. Um, I actually strongly disagree with uh, Castañeda's article because I think he forgot that Mexico actually does have an umbrella. And, and I think that the response to the crisis that um, John alludes to um, is likely to be the, the first option, he said, uh, a react to a number of problems with a proactive, proactive response. Um, I don't know if Trump will or, or will not send the letter to terminate the agreement. Um, I think even if he does send it, uh, he will be faced with a lot of challenges on whether he can or cannot terminate the agreement and overturn tariffs. If he were to overturn tariffs in a world of floating currency, I think most of them of the shock would be absorbed by the exchange rate rather than the disruption of supply chains. Uh, this has been, very, I think, very well studied. Uh, supply chains in the world have become so integrated that changes in currencies are disrupting trade very little. Um, and that means that if you put a tax, something very similar will happen. Um, there's also parallel to NAFTA, other agreements that uh, will be increasing become very, very relevant. Uh, the Pacific Alliance with the potential inclusion of, of additional developed markets will become a much larger country, much larger block with a massive pool of investors uh, who will get tax benefits uh, by joining the Pacific Alliance. Uh, we, we have the TPP, which came very close to be signed uh, in the last round with where they attempted it. So on the trade side, um, I think integration and what is likely to be the Mexican authorities' response to any NAFTA action that Trump may or may not take uh, will buffer things. For example, um, uh, the, an indication that they're willing to be proactive and respond the right way if NAFTA does get destroyed is, is that if, if, if NAFTA gets destroyed, you go back to WTO, so Mexico would face an average higher tariff of 3.5%. Uh, imports from the rest of the world, would, or particularly from, from the US, would face a tariff of 7% if nothing changes. What the Mexican government have sa has said it will do is they will cut all uh, tariffs for incoming goods to zero. Uh, because first, they don't want to engage in a trade war, but also because it's very smart. 
80% of Mexican imports are actually intermediate goods. So if you make importing your inputs cheaper, you also make your exports more competitive. So you buffer a lot of the low if you low up NAFTA. Um, the next part of the storm that we are faced with for next year is the elections. Um, a lot of people are concerned that some of the campaign pledges that have been made, particularly in overturning reforms and canceling the important uh, infrastructure projects, actually ha uh, have a lot of uh, checks and balances that would block them. Um, uh, thankfully, now Mexico has an independent and strong Supreme Court, uh, an independent and strong central bank, and now it also has a Congress. Uh, it's extremely unlikely that any of the three uh, major contenders in the election will have uh, anything more than 30% of Congress, which means they will have to negotiate everything which limits the, the substantially limits the risk of radical action. Uh, one candidate has pledged he will use referendums to overturn reforms. Again, uh, most of reforms cannot be overturned by a referendum because of, of, the, of the, how the referendum law is, is structured, and the Supreme Court and Congress will both be strong and independent. Um, the, um, there are risks. Uh, I, I think, the, as, as, as we discussed here earlier, the institution building process is, is going forward. Um, but the, a risk is that um, the, there will be actions taken to undermine civil society. Um, and, and civil society is vulnerable. In, in, in countries that become uh, democracies a, a little time ago, the civil society is only a, a mildly supported by the, by the, by the broader uh, population. Um, so the, 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 the camps fighting corruption are currently uh, basically uh, financed by, by a bunch of billionaire institution builders and a, and a small list of uh, foreign countries. So we could see actions be, uh, being taken to undermine that because uh, people who are benefiting from corruption are going to fight back, and they are. Uh, so we, there's not going to be uh, overnight solutions to either the corruption or security. Um, the, um, but I think overall, uh, the, the story is positive. The other thing that's, uh, that's very important, uh, which I have forgotten earlier, is uh, Mexico is really two countries. Uh, there, there's a, there's a, a very good article by making an, another advertising, uh, advertising <laughs> moment for McKinsey. Uh, it's called uh, Mexico, a tale of two, a two speed economy. Basically, what they're saying is there's, a, there's an open economy that's uh, integrated with the Western world, which, which is extremely um, uh, productive. If you look at the most productive plants that Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler have around the world, uh, something like two thirds of them are in Mexico. Uh, but uh, next to that, you have uh, a, a sector which is extremely isolated from the rest of the world and which has been contracting for for, uh, for decades. And so, what you, why why the country's growth rate tends to be uh, medi very mediocre is you have one half, of the, one uh, one part of the country which is essentially flying and the other one sinking. Um, and, and those, th those same parts of the country which are flying and sinking are also uh, uh, very different in how the rule of law, security, and all those things happen. The, the sectors, if you look at the list of which are the most corrupt and dangerous states in Mexico, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost a perfect correlation. States which are to the south of Mexico City uh, have much more are, are, are uh, contracting economically, they're much more corrupt, they're much more insecure. And states to the north, which are the ones integrated to the world, do better. And that has to do with, again, the import institutions. You, 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 you have uh, foreign players that come in, uh, they, they, they rise in the, in the middle, in the, the, the income levels of those people. You also start having a more active civil society, which demands more on security front and corruption fronts and things like that. And they also become more competitive. So, uh, as that move, move south, things improve, but we still have a big part of the country which is lagging. The other uh, six thing that which is relevant is that um, the sectors that, that are uh, faced with much more corruption problems also tend to be the sectors where the rest of the world is not there. The Mexican economy is still faced with a ridiculous number of uh, monopolies and oligopolies, uh, which uh, is one of the reasons why investment uh, overall has been lower. If you look at a typical equity index in the world, it's, let's say one quarter of it is financial. That's already a very open sector. Uh, one quarter of it is, well, 20% of it is utilities. That is faced with a number of uh, monopolies, but it's also faced with a number of, uh, of um of state-owned closures which are being unwound. So that brings investment. Uh, and, and if as that foreign investment comes in, institutions will become stronger. But it's currently also a fact that the states where the oil industry in Mexico is present are the states with very high murder rates, are the states with a lot of corruption, in part because uh, there's nobody to govern the, the powerful interests that exist there. Um, so I would say overall, 
Um, it's going to be a very volatile year. There's going to be a lot of uncertainty. People will be wondering whether, whether Trump will or will not send na the letter to terminate NAFTA. We think that if he does send the letter, it, it will not be that big of a blow regardless. And he may actually not be able to terminate it even if he does send it. Um, the elections are another source of, of uncertainty. People will be very nervous heading into the July elections. Um, it's currently basically a three-way tie. Uh, which is good news in the sense that uh, if we do get a, a bad outcome, outcome in the election, there will actually be a uh, very strong legislative opposing bad changes. It's also a risk because uh, it will be harder for any good new government to make uh, uh, reform adjustments and because of US tax reform, it's possible that uh, a tax reform will be ne become necessary. Um, so it will be a volatile year, but I think it's actually a, a, a relatively a, but much better than people expect. And I actually think that the, the local markets are, are very cheap. Thank you, Eduardo. I, I'm aware of the fact that it's 10 o'clock. Uh, we got started about 15, 20 minutes late. So uh, Chair's prerogative, we can extend this a little bit longer. I'll ask Chris and John maybe some brief comments on Mexico, and then we'll open up to questions and we'll try and do a hard stop at 1015. Uh, well, but if you have a prior engagements, of course, feel, you know, Please feel free to. Does that apply to me too? To leave. No. Uh, the, uh, no. Um, the, uh, so quickly on Mexico, I'm going to again sound my, my negative note here. Um, I, I don't, I mean, first of all, the three, I mean, Mexico doesn't have runoff elections. So I do think you're going, I mean, it, the general rule in political science is runoff elections are intended to like, you know, provide more legitimacy to a candidate. But what it means is a lot more candidates enter the race early on and the winner the, the second round serves as a winnowing down and people use that as even if they don't have much of a chance to win to extract compromises from the second round candidates mexico doesn't have that so i think actually you'll see unlike colombia you'll see people rallying around a consensus candidate to prevent amlo from winning i think that will be mead perhaps with his running mate margarita uh, de Ceballos. so i think the elections I'm, I'm a little less worried if you will about the electoral impact i i am though more worried, even if Trump does say send a letter to NAFTA, and I was talking to someone, the USTR representative who's negotiating, and this is, these are people who are in what they now call the deep state. We used to call them public servants. Now we call them the deep state. Um, and he was saying, look, if we, they were, he admitted they're trying to game it so that he can, Trump can walk away with a win, open up trade and services, you know, just claim we'll eventually get, uh, move to a trade surplus. Um, change the labor markets in Mexico so that there's it's more competitive. It's a level playing field. But he said, you know, this could all be undone with a tweet. We could just wake up. We could, we could totally game this, and then it could be undone. And I think that's potential. And I, and I, not just the rumors that were floated two days ago about Trump saying he's going to pull out. Um, you know, what I I'm going to risk a prediction here um, is that um, if he does do that, I think it, you're right. He can't fully pull out. There's a lot of safeguards built in, but it could be very much like, say, the Iran deal, where he just makes a lot of noise and it creates a certain amount of instability and uncertainty that tamps down investment and security for investors that could have very um, deleterious effects, Not even if he doesn't pull out or can't fully pull out. So I'm... I'm, I'm I think it's 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 risky, and you know, they're also still talking about the sun. You know, every five years they'll revisit NAFTA, which makes no sense whatsoever. Flies against any idea that you know about about security and trading investments and so on. Um, I think that's a real possibility. So I, um, I'm very worried. I'm very worried. Um, not so much about Mexican politics, but about sort of the 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 relationship and the trade relationship. John. You know, Mexico is very dear to my heart. I lived there for seven years, and the problem when you get really close to a country is you, you know, you see all of the, the, the positives and the negatives in a clearer light. And what I see right now for people operating outside of the big city, so um, people operating mines, people operating um, infrastructure projects, is a re as, is a genuinely uh, problematic security situation. Um, the going back to Calderon or pre-Calderon, there was a kind of a operating piece where the large narcos controlled different pockets of Mexico and they kept the peace. I was in Guerrero um, uh, about a year ago and they explained to me that when Calderon came in and sort of took a Colombian strategy of let's cut off the head of the three big uh, narco groups and you know do a Colombia does go from three carteles to 300 cartelitos um, the strategy in Mexico has created a lot of um, of chaos 
And so in the state of Guerrero, instead of having one guy, one strong man keeping the peace, in, you know, in working in cahoots with police, et cetera, you now have turf warfare amongst different um, criminal groups. And what you have right now is what happens in every sexenio is um, this is when, you know, the government cashes in, right? This is when the policemen shake you down twice as hard because they're going to be out of business in six months when the, after the, or 12 months when the new government comes in. Um, so the government, also because they blundered in, in Guerrero and killed all those kids, um, they've pulled back, the federal police have pulled back the policing actions that they were, that were beginning to have some effect in communities. And so what you have is a local policing authorities that are corrupted, the state level that depends. So in some states like Quereto, they're very effective, very good policing. But in others, you know, uh, like Guerrero, it's, it's a disaster. And so, and then the federal policing has been pulled back. The problem I see is I do believe AMLO will win because I think Mead was the wrong candidate. Um, we all like Mead. Mead speaks, you know, neoliberal speak very nicely. Um, but he's like Zedillo. You know, he's a very competent technocrat, but he has no popular support amongst the pre-militantes. The, half the pre is not going to vote for Mead because they can't relate to this guy. Uh, they're much more, it's much easier for them to relate to AMLO. So I think the picking of Mead was a, was a cataclysmic error for the pre. Um, I think basically it was a reaction to somehow bring credibility to the pre that had been, you know, painted as corrupt and, and, and Meade represents a much um, more credible and a, a guy with a lot of integrity, but I don't think he's electable. And um, the fact that there isn't a second round in Mexico, I think, gives clear advantage to AMLO. And the pan has basically been weakened by the defection of Calderon's wife. So. I, I, I really think that puts AMLO in a good light. I think that the, the fact that there's going to be some significant advisors to Trump leaving his government after the tax reform is, is voted through is going to mean that he's going to be even more off the rails than in the past, which means that he's going to vent that much more anger against Mexico, which is only going to help AMLO as this sort of anti-Trump candidate. The problem with AMLO is this. He's going to bring to, to government two types of people, either academic idealists who don't know how to govern or truly dirty old school pre guys who who like to make money while they're in government and the two of them together are going to be a disaster in terms of dealing with security i do not see the security situation in mexico improving under amlo in fact i see it getting worse and that is a problem for certain sectors that rely upon security outside of the main cities um, economically, I don't see, I think that, you know, the integration with the U.S. economy is still very solid and I see underpriced, I see investment still coming to Mexico, but I think, I think that security, which has been uh, the Achilles, Achilles heel of Mexico for a while, is not going to improve, especially with the, in light of uh, potential AMLO victory. So, hard, sorry to end it on such a negative note, but... <laughs> Fine. Okay. Um, thank you for staying with us. We have time for a few questions. One question. Oh well, we now now no, we're now you're going to get Chris really going. So that's this is this is this is not going to end well. Yeah. Go. Let's take it from the the. the uh, so no, not a pass. I mean, like everyone should talk about. It. Right. So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you start? No, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm saying you go down. I'm yeah, yeah. I was waiting yeah. for you to start. Uh, I'll, I'll, we'll go right down the line. People Remember, we had a rather, um, shall we say, um, animated event uh, here at the, uh, well, not here at the Monk School of Global Affairs um, uh, on Venezuela, which um, you know truly demonstrated the stakes there and also the somewhat the the comic tra tragedy of. Of Venezuela, but anyway, um, uh, I will only say the following, um, and I, I, I very much um, uh, uh, want to echo Chris's comments. Uh, however much we believe that systems as rotten as the, uh, and I'll call it Madurista because I don't think it's Chavista any longer, um, uh, that kind of system. However much our development theoretical mindset in the West uh, forces us to think that such things, such as screechants on the on the universe could continue, cannot continue, it will continue. Um, there is very, you know, the, the adaptability of the, of, of the Venezuelan people and their ability to sort of survive and cope with this is actually quite uh, deep. 
And um, uh, I, don't, I don't see this situation resolving anytime soon for the simple reason that, um, and, and Lenin wrote eloquently in this, in his uh, early writings, is that unless you organize, 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 you know, and you create a, 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 a fist to punch people out of power, power is a hard thing to get people out of, particularly when they're so embedded. So economic <laughs> reasons are not sufficient, in my opinion, to end the grip of Maduro uh, uh, on Venezuela. So I think we just, the, the thing I think we should watch is, are the um, potential ripple effects outside of Venezuela, because Venezuela I think will become even more corrupt and even more a locus of uh, kleptocracy and narco that actually, actually could have quite a negative impact on the rest of South America. But I think in terms of actually the change in Venezuela, I, I am unfortunately very un-optimistic uh, about, um, about that outcome. Yeah, I would agree entirely. I mean, the, 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 the capacity of this government and its willingness to just cling to power uh, is clearly gaming it. It will hold elections only if it feels it can win. And it manages to sort of dodge these bullets. And at the same time, the opposition, when asked to form a firing line, gets in a circle. <laughs> Um, so they're not going to do anything either. And so you know, I, I, we all sort of look at the, the indicators, whether it's, it's you know, the humanitarian crisis or the hyperinflation, which is now, what, 2,300%. Um, and we think this is, it, the writing of the wall is going to collapse. No, they're, they're gaming the system to stay in power, and they're not going to leave. Um, they're hoping for some sort of uptick in oil prices that will you know, give them a lifeline. Um, and I think that is one of the big, you asked about the black swan in, in the email we circulated. I think that's going to be, because I think the implications could first of all be dramatic in terms of the outflow of migration. Uh, we're already seeing it. Um, but we're also seeing, you know, if they de completely default, um, what it could mean in terms of oil markets and, and, and even debt markets. I mean, you know, Wall Street isn't always rational. If, if Venezuela completely defaults, it could, it could spark somewhat of a panic that I'm very worried about. I'll leave it there on, on that pessimistic note. I also don't see any way out, uh, even in the long run, because the more Maduro stays in power, and I, it seems like he's remain there for a long time still, uh, he's undermining institutions, the army, which used to be kind of the the arm that could um, that could counterbalance him, has been essentially decapitated and, the, and has replaced with people closer to him. We've had the creation of the of the Chavista Madurista by almost like paramilitary organizations which are used to terrorize people in general. So if, if, if somehow the, the regime were to fall, uh, how do you pacify all these people who are completely lying with the regime? The regime depend on, on it being there and will and will fight against whatever new government some miracle could bring in. Uh, the more they remain in place, the more they, they have the, obliterated their the the private sector and any hope of an economic rebound in the future what what the, the, the resources they have under the ground which are massive are slowly being pledged uh the, to somebody else and at some point if maduro stays there long you know not, not even that will be available to find a, to finance an economic um, uh, recovery in the future there was a a bunch of estimates uh, from the imf recently that say if if venezuela were to somehow have a change of regime the total amount of the IMF using every single channel of um, of resources they could allow them uh, for the total recovery of the country would not be enough to to finance the the the, the commitments of capital that would ne be necessary for one year, and this amount of money would be necessary for 20 years. The, uh, it, just the, the damage that has been done to the institutional and economic uh, framework of the country is absurd. No, I'm gonna in the past. I mean, I think these guys covered it very well. So. Uh, the, the, the only thing I'll add to it is to add fuel to the fire. It's, it's, it's a little bit unfortunate. You know, the, the, the country that was sort of leading the charge against Venezuela, one might say, at least from a di diplomatic perspective, was, was Peru. And given the recent events in Peru and the pardon of Fujimori, it, it's hard to see Peru uh, gaining, you know, uh, it's easy to see them losing credibility in the fight against a regime like Maduro, given the pardon that they just went through in Peru. So uh, if there are no more questions, um, we'll close the event. Again, thank you to Tories for hosting us. Thank you to our sponsors uh, who make this possible. Thank you to our panelists who've traveled far and wide. And of course, thank you to all of you for attending and sitting through 
two hours of what I hope for you was all interesting conversation. Thank you very much. I think that's the best we ever did. <laughs>